Gracias. Buenas tardes. Es un gran honor poder presentar al profesor Martín Jaffe, quien va a impartir uno de los coloquios con los cuales estamos celebrando este aniversario especial del Instituto de Física. El, la investigación del doctor Jaffe se dirige hacia el desarrollo de técnicas de imagen para tanto detectar, diagnosticar y tratar cáncer con un fuerte enfoque en cáncer de mama. Su grupo también está interesado en métodos para en desarrollar métodos que analicen patrones en las imágenes de manera de poder predecir riesgo de cáncer y usar estas herramientas para estudiar también las causas del cáncer de mama y para ayudar a desarrollar medidas preventivas. El doctor Jaffe hizo sus estudios de física en la Universidad de Manitoba, en Canadá, su maestría también en la Universidad de Manitoba y el doctorado en Biofísica Médica en la Universidad de Toronto. En este momento tiene una cantidad de nombramientos que no estoy segura de poderlos decir correctamente. Es Senior Scientist en el Sunnybrook Research Institute, es profesor en los departamentos de imagen médica y biofísica médica en la Universidad de Toronto, es director de un programa llamado Smarter Imaging Program en el Instituto de Ontario para Investigación en Cáncer y codirector de un programa de imágenes, eh, en fin, uno de sus de los honores eh, más altos que ha recibido. Él es miembro de la Orden de Canadá y quienes no lo sabíamos, aunque yo lo sospechaba porque había visto alguna vez unas fotos de la ceremonia de entrega de la Orden de Canadá, es el segundo honor que se entrega al mérito en el sistema de medallas y decoraciones del Canadá, de Canadá y reconoce los méritos notables de canadienses que hayan brindado un servicio distinguido y que hayan hecho una diferencia para el Canadá a través de contribuciones a lo largo de su vida en cualquier área en, en la que ellos se desempeñen. Eh, me extiendo un poquito más en esto, el, esta orden de Canadá, su lema Dice, ellos desean un mejor país, tomado de la Biblia. Además es doctor honoris causa de la Universidad de Manitoba. Es, como nos imaginaremos, es miembro de múltiples comités, es co-investigador en particular en este momento de un proyecto eh, que, está, que ocurre tanto en Estados Unidos como en Canadá, es un ensayo clínico para realizar tamizaje con tomosíntesis para la detección temprana del cáncer de mama, 2016-2021, más de 100 millones de dólares de financiamiento para poder determinar si la técnica de tomosíntesis, que es una mamografía en tres dimensiones, tiene la capacidad de detectar también tempranamente el cáncer ha registrado cinco patentes, eh, alrededor de 300 publicaciones y acabo de echarle una mirada a su Google Scholar, él no sabía 33.000 citas aproximadamente a su trabajo. Él ha, sido una, él ha tenido una influencia en el propio desarrollo y guía de nuestro grupo aquí, eh, sobre todo por su trabajo, por la alta calidad de su trabajo. Yo diría que ese es un distintivo, si uno ve el nombre de Martin Jaffe en un paper, uno puede estar seguro que el trabajo es de calidad. Martin, you are very welcome to our institute. Muchas gracias, and, uh, y uh, buenas tardes. Um, 
I'm just I'm delighted to be here uh, in this uh, wonderful place and uh, to, to meet uh, the group. And uh, it's very nice to see uh, medical physics and all of the other types of physics so closely interacting with each other because I think that's really a wonderful benefit. In, in our university, medical physics is somewhat separated from the other physicists and we have to go visit them or they visit us uh, for, uh, for collaborations. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, honor, uh, I just wanted to mention, I, I, I know that one of your call, this room is named after one of your colleagues who's done many wonderful things uh, for this institution. And I just wanted to pay tribute to her because I know that, uh, uh, that she is uh, one who died uh, from cancer. Uh, today, what I hope to do is to continue um, the discussion that I began yesterday and uh, I'm afraid more of the physics actually was discussed in yesterday's presentation uh, because I work in an area where we're really working between disciplines, between physics, engineering, and many of the medical disciplines. We work closely together as well as, of course, um, computer, the computer uh, science which is becoming increasingly important. So what I'll uh, try to do today is uh, first talk a little bit about some of the improvements in breast cancer screening, uh, particularly contrast enhanced imaging, because I know that there is work in this area being done. I saw yesterday some excellent uh, work being done in this area uh, here in uh, uh, Mexico City. Um, I'll talk a little bit, I wonder if maybe the microphone is just a little too, too loud, uh, because I hear some ringing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, probably easier for you <laughs> without it. Um, I'll talk about monitoring response to uh, therapy because it's in a very port important application of imaging. And th the main theme really is how an imaging scientist can contribute in different ways uh, to improving the situation uh, with respect to breast cancer. And of course, the story is very similar for other cancers as, as well. I'll discuss some, a little bit, just show you some uh, interesting pictures uh, that were done uh, by one of my colleagues, Dr. Kulervo Huninen, who is the director of uh, our group, who is originally from Finland and is a physicist working in HIFU, High Intensity Focused Ultrasound for Therapy. And this is image-guided ultrasound therapy. And then I'll move to um, really a transition in my career which is when I realized in the area of pathology how primitive the techniques in many cases were where the, radio, where the pathologist is looking at a slide and making very quantitative uh, assessments of information just by looking at the slide. And of course, they're very good at this, but I felt that by uh, implementing, by really uh, borrowing some of the techniques from physics and from medical imaging and image analysis, we could help them do a better job. And it's still early, so some of the work is still in the research phase, and we'll see where it, it gets to. But I'll talk a little bit about our work on whole mount images, uh, image multiplexing, and the beginnings of our work on what we, uh, is called radiomics. Uh, and I'll repeat a little bit from uh, yesterday's talk because I think it's very important. There's a huge opportunity to reduce deaths from breast cancer and also reduce some of the misery that comes when the cancer is detected at an advanced stage by doing better quality imaging, by using imaging in different ways, and by using physics and our understanding of how uh, pictures are made to improve the usefulness of those pictures. So we know that if you uh, combine earlier detection through breast cancer screening with mammography and the improvements in therapy, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy that have taken place, uh, you can reduce mortality from breast cancer and you can reduce in some cases the needs for the harsh treatments. And uh, I'll just show once again this picture from the uh, uh, Musée uh, de, de um, Palacio uh, de, de Bellas Artes, uh, which is uh, in this city. This is uh, Diego Rivera, uh, man, the controller of the universe, and this is just a very smart of this, a small part of this picture. 
Um, this is Darwin. He doesn't have much to do with my story today. I think this may actually be Diego Rivera in the corner here. We're not sure. But what you see is um, radiation used for imaging and radiation used for therapy. And in this case, very sadly, this, this is breast cancer. And the, the breast cancer at the point of therapy is so advanced, I doubt whether the therapy would be very useful for this woman. So part of the challenge is to detect the cancer early so it's not visible. It's, it's seen uh, small, where it's seen like this rather than like this. And the outside of the breast, you wouldn't notice anything as compared to here, where the cancer is already showing and is quite obvious. We've done some work in my lab just doing uh, Monte Carlo type modeling to predict the effect of um, early detection in breast cancer screening using different approaches, starting at a particular age, ending at a particular age, and doing the examination every one year or every two years or some hybrid. This shows, this curve shows the deaths from breast cancer in a, 100, 000, a group of 100,000 women. We've modeled them as cases using Monte Carlo, the Monte Carlo approach. And at each stage, whether a cancer occurs, whether it's aggressive or not, the type of cancer, how quickly it grows, um, whether it will be detected or not with a different technology, each of these is modeled using a, a probability in a Monte Carlo type calculation. And this is the output. And you can see that if you don't do any screening with age, at young women, there's very little breast cancer. But by the time you reach 40, the rate of death starts to rise and keeps going up. And then eventually, as women get older, gradually it falls off. And women are dying of other things at this point. If you start screening at age um, 50, then you see this curve here. So no change until you begin screening, but a huge drop in mortality uh, starting during the period when screening occurs until age 74 when it stops. And then it starts resembling the unscreened curve. And if you start earlier at age 40, and in many countries, breast cancer is a significant disease at age 40, beginning at around age 40. Uh, women usually don't die at that point. They die some year, a few years later. But the cancers that cause the death can be found and treated uh, this early. And you see the effect here, uh, the drop from uh, starting at age 50. Of course, the it's the uh, difference in the integrals here, or the integral of the difference, rather, uh, which gives you uh, the amount of effect. So you see a huge effect from no screening and a further effect by starting earlier. And some of the numbers, here's the uh, uh, different strategies when you begin, how often you screen, what age you start, what age you stop, and a percent mortality reduction. And you can see if you start age 40 till 74, uh, and women actually get the screens and they're done with high quality, I must emphasize that, that you might achieve 53% mortality reduction. And uh, if you start at age 50, you still get a mortality reduction, not as much. And if you do it every two years, about 36% mortality reduction. And you can see all the different uh, strategies and what the results might be. We also uh, looked at the uh, number of women you actually have to screen with that regimen uh, or scenario in order to save one life. And you can see it's about 86 um, women with this uh, scenario per life saved. So these kind of modeling analyses, of course, they could be done much more quickly than doing observational experimental type studies. And you can vary the parameters, uh, which you can't do in the real world very easily. The modeling is very useful. We can also do cost effective and uh, cost effectiveness analysis, which of course the government in Canada, we have a public health system, so the government wants to know how much does this cost, and we can do that analysis based on the data that come out of models like this, just adding the economic side to it. This just summarizes, if we look at the number of lives saved versus the number of screens a woman has in her lifetime, you can see it's almost line a linear relationship. If you look at the number of years of life saved, this is called quality adjusted, years of life saved, so it takes into account also the quality of the life, then um, you see it's, all, again, almost linear. The more screens a woman has, 
the greater the benefit, of course, the greater the cost for doing this. The effect in society is quite clear, and I have one example given to me by a surgeon, so I showed it yesterday, I'll show it again today because I think it's very valuable. This is a woman who had breast cancer in the 1960s. It was found um, by herself because it was, uh, she could feel it from the outside. She had what was done then because it was a fairly large cancer. Fortunately, she lived. Um, but, of course, she lost her, the entire breast, plus the muscle, the pectoral muscle, plus some of the tissue, muscle tissue in her arm. And, of course, this has very negative effects on the quality of her life. Fortunately, she lived. Forty years later, she developed another cancer. This time, she, it was found with mammography screening. And this is the result after treatment of that cancer. Most of the breast was saved. And of course, the result, there's no loss of the muscle, and, and she has much better function on her left side because this was cancer was detected earlier through breast cancer screening. So we can say that screening for breast cancer can reduce, reduce breast cancer deaths by 30% to 50%, depending on how it's done. It can prevent the loss of, uh, women's, of women in the middle uh, may, may be the most productive part of their lives where they may be working or raising children or both. It can reduce the need for uh, procedures like mastectomy, removal of the whole breast and some muscle, or chemotherapy, which is a very difficult procedure to go through. But it must be organized with enforced standards so that the quality of the mammography is high, so the quality of the interpretation by the radiologist is high, so we need to have trained radiologists, uh, and that we need to make sure that women are invited to participate at the proper time, and that they do come at the proper time, and the data is, are uh, recorded to monitor the whole process. So actually, I've, I've mentioned some of this already, uh, but I should say here that bad screening could be worse than no screening because if you do bad quality screening, the woman goes away thinking that she does not have breast cancer. If the screening is poor, it's possible that she does have breast cancer and it's not going to be um, treated uh, early enough. So I'll move to some of the technology. My group, and uh, I believe Maria Esther spoke of this, uh, was um, uh, involved in the development of digital mammography. We started our work with my graduate students around 1985. By 2000, we had a prototype system uh, working, and we were fortunate to get involved in a clinical study, a multi-institutional study comparing digital mammography with film mammography. And we found that the digital technology um, gave us an improvement uh, in terms of um, better cancer detection for women with dense breasts, that means the breast has a lot of fibrous tissue in it, and young women who also tend to have denser breasts with more fibr fibrous tissue. And the way it did this is to give better image quality, better contrast, better signal to noise ratio, and better dynamic range. And the way this happened is through the development of um, digital detectors, electronic detectors based on our understanding of optics, and solid state physics, and combining some of this knowledge and engineering, of course, to couple initially um, phosphors, uh, structured phosphors, uh, through fiber optic, coherent fiber optic bundles to CCDs, uh, and digitize uh, the output of the CCD to make a digital image. We also developed selenium detectors using uh, understanding the properties of amorphous selenium and how it can be used as a photoconductive detector to give very high resolution because uh, the, um, the x-rays are absorbed by the photoelectric effect in the detector. They produce uh, um, uh, electrons and then electron hole pairs. And in a strong electric field, they can be collected very efficiently without moving laterally. So all of the electric field calculations and understanding of the properties of amorphous selenium uh, people in, in our labs were working on these things to help develop these technologies. So you can see how physics uh, is uh, important at one part. 
Then, of course, once you digitize the output of these detectors, uh, you have a digital image, and it can be manipulated through image processing. So all of the computer science and, and, and understanding of how you improve the quality of images by uh, Fourier um, filtering, by uh, accentuating certain spatial frequencies in the Fourier domain, all of these things can help to improve the visibility of cancers. And of course, then also the doctors have to be educated better in terms of how to use the new technology to get the benefit uh, from it. Um, but once we had digital images, it opened up new opportunities for us to go further with uh, using this platform to develop new technologies, uh, which could be even more useful. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that. But it's important to realize, as some doctors in Canada don't realize this, and in the United States, that there's more to images than just the pictures. Uh, some of them are just happy, wonderful digital image, this is great. We can adjust the contrast electronically, uh, digitally on the display. We can make the, adjust the brightness, that's all I need. But these images contain information, and if we can extract that information, it could be very useful. And that opens the area of considering what we call imaging biomarkers. Uh, some people call this radiomics, it's just a, a nice um, buzzword. And then going further and taking information from medical images, images of the body, and combining it with information from tissue that may be taken out at biopsy or after surgery, combining the information to try to get a better assessment of disease to help guide treatment. And, that's, uh, and if we go further and start doing genomic analysis, looking at the actual DNA or RNA of, in tissue samples, and combine that with image information, that's called radio genomics. And I'll tell you now, we're just at the beginning of that work, so I don't have anything exciting to show you uh, today on, on that work, but I can show you kind of where we're beginning the work. And of course, we can use image reconstruction, Fourier and other types of re image reconstruction approaches to make better quality images that may be more useful. So that's another area where physicists and people with mathematical skills uh, can, can uh, contribute. So here's one example. This, we refer to this as contrast-enhanced breast imaging. I had a, a master's student in uh, around 2000. Uh, her name is Maria Scarpathiotakis, um, who uh, worked on this, and uh, we decided that perhaps we could see breast cancer better if we actually used contrast, uh, an injected contrast agent. And these agents existed for other examinations in the body, so they were legal for use in the body. They are based on iodine. And of course, iodine absorbs x-rays much more strongly than uh, tissue in the body. So you get much higher contrast where iodine is present. You inject the iodine, and what happens here is you can, a tumor, when it's growing, grows too quickly for the blood supply. It needs oxygen to, to, to uh, survive. So when the tumor is growing quickly, it actually sends out a signal. To, ask, to require new blood vessels to be created. This is called angiogenesis. And there's chemicals the tumor sends out and causes uh, the existing blood vessels to start to make sprouts. And those sprouts produce new vessels. But these vessels are of poor quality. It's like houses that are built quickly and poorly. And therefore, they're leaky. And uh, if you inject the contrast medium into the blood vessels, this agent, the iodine, will leak out and can be imaged. And uh, that's the principle, and this principle was, has been used in MRI, and we thought this also could be used with digital mammography. So we began to create a system, a way of, of doing this on a digital mammography machine. Um, and there's different approaches, but the main approach is, uh, well, I should just mention, here's another, I, this is an electron microscope showing why we see things uh, with this kind of imaging. And when can, this shows a normal blood vessel uh, structure. Uh, and when you have uh, cancer, the, the blood vessels that are created by angiogenesis look like this. They have holes in the junctions between cells, so they leak. Uh, and therefore, we get this effect. So very simply, simplest physics one can do, exponential attenuation of x-rays, 
uh, we can, uh, when we image uh, through the breast, we can produce an image and at each point, the amount of x-rays at each energy is given by this equation. If we have a polyenergetic spectrum, so there's an integral over energy that we have to consider, and then there's scattered radiation, x-rays bounce around in the breast, so we get a scatter component. It gets a little more complicated, but basically here it's quite simple. And if we have some contrast medium in here, we get a slightly different equation, uh, which takes into account the difference in attenuation coefficient and the thickness of the um, different object, which in this case is the angiogenic blood vessel. So you could do a linear subtraction and you get this result, which is uh, maybe useful, but you see it still has dependence of the overall thickness of the breast, capital T, and the attenuation coefficient of the breast. If you do a logarithmic subtraction, they disappear and you get a result which depends only on the difference in attenuation coefficient between the normal tissue and the iodine. So that's where the, the cancer um, actually is and how thick uh, that area is. So the bigger the cancer, uh, the bigger signal you'll get. But the nice thing is that T and mu disappear. So the effect of the normal tissue, what you're really seeing is only the difference here. And therefore you get an image with much less background. So there's the background image, the image with the um, iodine in it, and the logarithmic subtraction should give you something where you're only seeing the uh, uh, area of leakage of iodine. And this, uh, you may or may not believe it, but these are actual clinical images done this way. Here's a mammogram. It's not hard to see there's something here, even in the mammogram. The, the reason we see this is because this is more fat and this is more fibroglandular tissue. And, a, and of course, the cancer is very similar to fibroglandular tissue. Sometimes we don't see cancers because they're surrounded by this other very similar kind of tissue. But when we do the subtraction, we see this is the most interesting case I think we had because you can see a dark area where nothing seems to be happening. You can see this area here where there's um, clearly some iodine um, and you can see this ring. And this is traditional for cancers, this area where because actually some of the cells in the middle here are dead and therefore not much is happening, but you get this active ring around the outside. And interestingly, this changes with time because uh, where there's can the, the contrast medium actually eventually gets pulled back into the venous system. So it gets removed. And if you look over time, you actually see that there's some kinetic information. And you see 10 minutes later, this has largely disappeared. So we get information both from the enhancement, the angiogenic effect, and also the rate of washout we, we can look at the rate of enhancement and also the rate of washout. And it tends that uh, this is not, unfortunately, this is not completely um, generalizable, but often we see with uh, active cancers that we get a rapid intensification and then a fairly rapid washout, whereas with um, less, uh, more benign uh, disease, we see more of a plateau. It, it, uh, we see uh, the enhancement, and then it tends to stay constant. So this is an area, and I know that work is being done here. It's also being done in New York City and in uh, Germany and in France. And uh, I think it's a very useful way of seeing cancers that are not going to be seeing, seen using conventional mammography, even digital mammography. Some cancers simply won't be seen that way, and the only way to detect them will be using another phenomenon, another type of signal, that due to a physiological effect, angiogenesis. So here's another one, and I believe there's some interest uh, here. Uh, uh, on this, uh, again, on this campus, I think Yvonne is working on, on this area, which is looking at ways of monitoring response to cancer therapy. It's very important, especially because we're now doing something called neoadjuvant therapy. And neoadjuvant therapy is essentially um, therapy that's done before the surgery. Sometimes if the cancer is very big, it's beneficial to do, give chemotherapy first uh, be, because that will re reduce the size of the cancer and make it more easier to do the surgery. 
So this is um, um, a technique, and unfortunately, I only have this slide for, uh, today to, to bring, but it's a technique where we actually use infrared radiation at multiple wavelengths to image the breast. And we can do what's called diffuse optical tomography. So what we're doing, as you probably know, there's so much scattering of light in the breast or in any tissue that it's very little uh, of the light goes through without any interaction. But what you can do is you can look at, um, at light that is scattered relatively little and you can look at multiple wavelengths and create a low resolution. It's not a fine image like a mammogram. It's a fairly coarse spatial resolution image with large pixels, but where the pixels represent actual physiological or metabolic information. And here we're looking at the concentration of hemoglobin, and it's actually deoxyhemoglobin, hemoglobin that, where the oxygen has been used up. And we find that that's actually a very good indicator of active cancer. And you can do this kind of imaging without any invasive, and this, there's, no radi uh, there's no ionizing radiation. You don't have to open the patient up. You can image the patient. So if you're doing the, the neoadjuvant therapy, you can basically image the patient and see if there's a change over time in the intensity of the deoxyhemoglobin. If it's re reduced over time, then it means there is response to therapy. If it's not reducing, probably that therapy is not worth doing anymore. And the therapy may take six or eight weeks to do. So it's important to know early if it will work or not. If it's not going to work, it's important for the oncologist to consider doing something else as early as possible. Now to validate this system, I'm jumping a little ahead of myself, we actually developed a technique of making very large pathology slides. The, we did a small study of women who uh, had large cancers, and we asked them for permission once they had uh, the surgery. The surgery was usually to remove the entire breast. We asked them if we could do examination of the tissue in pathology. And we developed a technique of making very large glass slides and digitizing them so that we could actually do comparisons against these images. This is active cancer. These purple areas are active cancer. And what we could do is compare what, what we saw in these images with what we see at the end of therapy. And if this area is starting to disappear, it means, uh, or has, has disappeared, and we saw that it disappeared on the images that we did in vivo in the patient, it's telling us that this imaging technique is a useful way of monitoring therapy. So this is our validation. And in fact, we did um, um, looked at here at different, this is called an H&E type pathology, one type of stain, and this is one that looked at the density of the microvessels. And in this case, there was not a good response. Um, so when the surgery was done, we still see uh, evidence of uh, active, uh, can that there was active cancer. So that was a very interesting approach. Uh, another one that's being done by a colleague of mine whose name is uh, Gregory Charnata, who has a PhD, um, he did his PhD working on electron microscopy, and um, he um, then did a whole medical degree and became a radiation oncologist, so he has very good qualifications in cancer. He is using ultrasound as a way to um, assess whether there's been a response or not. And you can see uh, signatures of the ultrasound. He uses the, what, what's called the radio frequency signal before it's been processed to make an image. And he measures things like the uh, amount of scattering that's taking place. So you can do texture analysis, quantitative texture analysis of these ultrasound images over time during the course of this neoadjuvant treatment. Again, it's non-invasive. It's done just with an ultrasound transducer. And to monitor th uh, things like the amount of, whoops, like the amount of scattering and the, uh, the um, uh, other parameters of the uh, ultrasound response associated with the uh, uh, imaging the tissue to distinguish between a patient who is responding, you see the images look quite different over time, and a patient where the therapy is clearly not doing anything. And, in, and he claims that even in a matter of a week or so, you can start to tell the difference. And I think 
you know, there's a suggestion that he may be right. Maybe it's a few weeks, a couple of weeks, but very quickly you start to see if there's a response or if there's no response. So this is a tool that may be very valuable in oncology where we're using understanding of the physics of imaging, in this case acoustics, and, um, the, uh, uh, and working in a clinical environment to uh, uh, make quantitative images. I'll show you some very exciting images uh, that I just got the day before I left, so I can't say too much about them yet, but I think they're, they're really, um, it's an area that I think is going to be very important. I mentioned earlier, and this is using uh, high intensity focused ultrasound for treatment, and the other aspect of this is using imaging to guide that therapy. So this is the work of Dr. Uh, Dr. Hunnanen in my institution. And what he's doing is he makes these very large arrays of ultrasound transducers that can create a lot of power at a target location. So it's similar to the idea of radiation therapy. You'd like to spread out the radiation so that there's as little energy deposited near the periphery as possible, and you concentrate as much energy at the point where you're trying to do the treatment. This is uh, just uh, one of the arrays, and of course you make these better by uh, covering a wider angle and having more transducers. And uh, this is just a skull phantom where he can do quantitative assessment uh, of, this, um, of this system. And what he's doing here is he's measuring, uh, using, in this case, they do MRI imaging, and they can use the MRI to do thermometry. You can actually measure temperature by using an appropriate pulse sequence in magnetic resonance imaging. And with the transducer array, of course, he's trying to get all the energy as much as possible concentrated here. With the transducer array, initially, you get quite a, a, a varied spatial distribution. But once you have this information, you can use um, uh, calculation to make a, uh, set up correction factors for how you apply the power to the individual elements in this array and create a very nice tight distribution of energy for uh, gi giving, this, um, uh, giving this treatment. And um, basically, um, this is done inside of a MRI machine so that you can do the um, temperature measurement at the same time. And just here's an example. Here's a, um, a scan on the patient where you can actually see the target of interest and you can, you can locate it, you can apply the energy, and of course you can image during the procedure while you're applying the energy, you can do the imaging to watch, you're basically cooking the lesion and watch and stop the procedure as soon as you've cooked it enough. So he's using this for treating tumors in the brain, for treating pain in some cases, you can actually cause relief of pain, for reducing tremor, and these are remarkable results. A patient can come in and can't hold a glass of water, and at the end of the treatment, which may take uh, an hour, uh, the patient uh, has control of his or her hand. So I think this whole area is one that's very exciting. The other thing that could be done, as you may know that there is a barrier between the blood uh, system and the brain, and using um, ultrasound, you can actually stimulate the blood-brain barrier to open up temporarily. And this allows you to actually combine this approach with the use of drugs, with therapeutic drugs. Allow those drugs into the brain tissue for a short period of time in a liposome, a small uh, container, a small package which can get to this location, and then uh, use some heat from the ultrasound to cause the liposome to open and deliver uh, chemical therapy at the same time. So the combination of heat and a chemical thera therapy can give you um, a, a, a beautiful effect in terms of uh, uh, th treatment efficiency, we think. Now, this is the group in my lab who works on uh, some of the, area, uh, the work I'm going to discuss in the next uh, few minutes, um, which is, and I should get an idea, what time do I need to be finished here? How much more time do I have? 20. Okay. Okay, you just, and if I go too long, you just say stop and I will stop. Um, so these uh, folks come from, uh, interestingly, come from all over the world. This gentleman is, a, um, is actually trained as a pathologist from China, 
He's from Nigeria, and he's a lab uh, a pathology technician. He's from Pakistan, he's a pathology technologist. She's from Jamaica, uh, from um, uh, Taiwan, from Canada, and from the Ukraine. So we have a, quite an international group uh, working in my lab, but working on quantitative um, use of imaging in pathology. So I showed you already the whole mount images that we're, we, we're creating. Um, we just simply have taken the technology and made everything bigger so that we can, we can cut very accurate sections, only four microns thick, uh, but we can make very large sections uh, to um, create the slides from. But more important, we have a laser a scanner based on confocal optics. There's a company in Canada that is, has, is brilliant at doing optical systems. And this is a fluorescent scanning system that can scan down to about a half a micron uh, spatial resolution and do color fluorescence um, uh, digitization. So we can produce images. And then, of course, once they're digital, we've created software to, that allows us to display them, analyze them, and create annotations uh, according to the different types of tissue that we see. So this is just an example of some of the specimens we work with. This is breast cancer. The, can the bad cells are the ones that look purple here. This is prostate cancer, and this is the entire prostate in this case. So we can do studies um, understanding best how to treat prostate cancer. And this is actually an entire section of a human brain. So it's, uh, this is a, a, a tool which is not only used by us, but also by my colleagues in, in neurology and in prostate cancer, uh, for their, and of course the breast cancer people in their work. So the question really, wh why, do, why are we interested in this? And our, we think maybe by imaging multiple biomolecules on the same tissue to create a signature for cancer. Now, one of the reasons we want to do that, especially in breast and prostate cancer, is not all cancers are equally uh, bad. And frequently, we're, the doctors are accused of over-treating some cancers, causing the patients to go through harsh treatments when the cancer really doesn't require such harsh treatment. But in order to do less harsh treatment, and in other words, not treat everyone exactly the same way, we need to understand the cancer better, understand its characteristics. And this approach, we want to do that by imaging multiple biomolecules um, at the same time on the same tissue. And we do this by selecting antibodies that bind to specific molecules of interest, and we label them um, with fluorescent markers. Uh, two of them are called Psi-3 and Psi-5, and they fluoresce and produce different color light. And the approach we use is quite simple. Um, we stain the tissue. We produce the tissue on a, a flat section, four microns thick on glass. We stain it with two anti different antibodies. One has a Psi-3 fluorescent uh, label, one has Psi-5. And we image digitally using this fluorescent um, technique. And then when we're finished imaging, we use a bleach to get rid of the Psi-3 and Psi-5 effect. And we use two different antibodies, again labeled with Psi-3 and Psi-5. So by bleaching, it lets us use these antibodies, uh, these um, fl fluorescent uh, markers, over and over again, but attached to different antibodies. So essentially, it's just a sequence where you apply, you acquire a background image, you measure what's called autofluorescence, the fluorescence that is just background, nothing to do with um, these uh, markers. You image, uh, you record the image of the antibodies, you do some correction, uh, you um, get rid, then you get rid of, um, sorry, you um, got ahead of myself here. Uh, so you have the two antibody la labels here. Uh, you um, basically then image digitally, and you get an uh, image here. It's called immunofluorescence. You have the image with two antibodies in the two different colors. Then you do the bleaching to get rid of the color on the existing ones, and then you repeat this again with two different antibodies. And you just keep doing this. You can do it perhaps 60 or more times. So you can look at 60 different molecules on the same tissue. Um, this is the system we began to use. It's basically was just a digital microscope with some um, uh, microfluidic uh, system in here to do all of the chemical 
um, things that needed to be done. And we now have a robotic system which makes things a little less labor intensive. But the idea is, as I mentioned, not all breast cancers are the same. So we need to have better tools to decide which ones are aggressive and which ones, and they'll kill people, and which ones are indolent or sleepy cancers. And this is a, a nice example of a breast cancer looking at three different molecules. So the first one is a molecule which was discovered a few years ago of importance called HER2. And HER2 is expressed on the outside membrane of cells. And we labeled it using the, a red fluorophore. Of course, when you're using digital images, you can make it any color you want. So in this case, um, you see the membrane of the cells, the outer layer of the cells are red for those cells that uh, are positive for this particular antibody. And you see nothing for the cells that are, are, don't contain that antibody or they don't express it, don't overexpress that antibody. We can look at another one. And the nice thing is everything is spatially uh, registered. So here's cytokeratin, which gives us additional information about the cells. And then finally, um, a very important uh, receptor is called the estrogen receptor, which tells us, uh, I should mention that there, if a cell uh, is HER2 positive, it means that cancer can be treated with a drug called Herceptin, which is important because it tells us what drug would work on that woman's cancer. Um, we can also look at the estrogen receptor which is in the center, the nucleus. And you see, we labeled it yellow, uh, digitally, of course. And you see that any nucleus, the center of the cell that lights yellow, means that cell overexpresses the estrogen receptor. And cells that are estrogen receptor positive can be treated with a drug called tamoxifen, and also by a whole series of drugs that are known as aromatase inhibitors. So this is telling us something about the cancer, but not just putting things in a bottle and doing a measurement. We see a picture where on every cell we know exactly what's happening, which cells are positive for which molecules. And what we hope is that we can create a more sophisticated, um, a more sophisticated algorithm to create a signature that tells us about the cancer by using the information from these different um, uh, molecules. This is an example where we're getting into uh, additional ones. Um, I can't read, I have to read it on my own slide here. So these are related to uh, immunology, and there's a whole area known as immunotherapy, which can also be considered for treating cancer, not just breast cancer, but other cancers. So we can also, in addition to the standard markers for breast cancer, we can also look at the immune markers, and we can create a, uh, a composite image, which really tells us something in, in terms of uh, what is, um, um, what, what the cancer is doing, what kind of cancer it really is. Now, this, this takes me to the area of radiomics, and as, again, I apologize, we're just at the beginning of this work. But the idea here is um, we have been working on breast tomosynthesis, which is a sort of 3D type of mammography. We think it will produce better quality images. And we can take measurements. We can do measurements of shape, morphology, texture, and other statistical features um, from these images, which may be informative about the nature of the cancer we see here. We can combine it with information uh, from the uh, pathology in terms of individual molecules. And what we hope to do is to create a signature which tells us what to do next with the cancer. So there's a whole bunch of problems that our medical colleagues are bringing to us where they think that this approach combining information from the in vivo images and uh, registering them to pathology images and really uh, combining this information on the, on the expression of different molecules uh, will be helpful in getting a, a better answer clinically. Uh, sorry, this is the wrong place. Uh, so we can look at things like correlation analysis to see uh, whether uh, there's a, uh, how, maybe there's redundant information. We can figure out what the key fundamental information is that actually is informative by looking at these kind of correlations of molecules. This one here, which is called key 67 tells us how proliferative a uh, cancer is. So it tells us how active a cancer actually is. Um, so different molecules gives, give us information about different aspects of the cancer. 
And we can also help the pathologist by doing some of the things they do very slowly, qualitatively, and probably not very accurately by using the computer and using algorithms to count cells. So we can automatically count cells. We can identify cancer cells using quantitative features. And we can actually create images that show us where the cancer is, which cancer cells are more active, which are less active, uh, how many nuclei there are, and the types, uh, the particular characteristics of those nuclei. So these are tools. I think we're at the very beginning of what we're doing with, with this information, but I think it's going to be very uh, exciting in the next few years now that we have these things working and a lot of our energy has gone into validating this, making it work. Um, the other thing we can do, of course, and everyone in the world is playing with this, is to use artificial intelligence approaches. In our case, uh, we're mostly trying to work with convolutional neural networks or what people call deep learning, to try to um, pull out more information than perhaps we understand ourselves. So by using many images where we know the truth about those images, uh, we can teach algorithms or allow algorithms to teach themselves uh, to pull out additional information that we think may help us get a better characterization of, of, uh, t of, of tissue. And uh, we, we can also move beyond looking just at the biomolecules, the proteins, and go into the genetic world and look at genetic mutations. If we find an area in our, in our um, uh, pathology where, that looks suspicious and maybe we think may be aggressive, we can sample this area and do genetic uh, sequencing of either DNA or RNA and look at mutations that are associated with, say, one area versus the other area of disease to see if the disease is actually homogeneous or may vary even from place to place. And it may be that the reason patients die of cancer is because um, we, when we sample the disease, we're getting a story in one location, but we really don't have the full picture uh, in terms of what's going on elsewhere in the cancer. So I think I've really uh, talked enough uh, today. I hope I've given you a flavor of some of the things that you can do because of the time I've had to be somewhat superficial, but I wanted to give you a kind of a picture of the different areas where physicists are working in imaging to try to bring more information uh, to their colleagues. And some of my, uh, I'm working with some very interesting people. Most of these people here are biologists, uh, surgeons, oncologists at different hospitals, interested in different types of cancers. My own area is breast cancer, but uh, Dr. Ohashi, for example, is interested in ovarian cancer. There are people interested in cancer of the head and neck, uh, lung cancer, et cetera. And uh, a lot of the tools that we're developing can be used across these different uh, platforms. So I think uh, we're probably pretty close to being out of time. So I think this might be a good place to stop. I'd like to thank you again for inviting me, giving me this honor to be here. Uh, I hope this is interesting, and of course, if you want to talk about anything else afterwards, I'd uh, be delighted to do so. Muchas gracias. And again, this is part of the same uh, Diego Rivera mural, which everyone here knows, yes. Preguntas <laughs> or questions, either. <laughs> yes. um, yesterday, uh, Ivan Rosado asked for an, uh, an advice for how to get closer at the women that are afraid of uh, using the mammography. But in your opinion, I, I want to know how uh, this could work in a country like Mexico, where 88% um, of the Mexican population speaks Spanish and only 60% got uh, internet access. So... Okay, so that's not a physics question, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not an imaging question, but it is an, a very important question. Um, I, I think the only way you can do it uh, is you have to communicate with people. It takes effort. If 88% of the people speak Spanish, then clearly you have to communicate in Spanish, but you also have to, if possible, try to develop the same messages in other languages that people uh, speak. I know that's a huge effort, and um, I don't have any obvious solution how to do it, except 
These days, we do have um, better tools available for doing translations. That may be helpful. The internet problem, I don't know. The internet is a wonderful way of, of um, spreading information. Of course, also you can spread misinformation on the in internet. But it's certainly an, a very efficient and cheap way of getting information broadly to people. Things like YouTube are very effective. What do you do if you can't get to people? Um, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, I think that it's, it's something that governments have to deal with. Um, our government has a, si a similar problem. We have multiple indigenous populations in Canada. Uh, my wife, who's here in the front row, has been working. She's a psychologist, but uh, she, she's been trying to work on, on that because they, not only is it different languages, but people understand things in a different way according to their culture. And if people are afraid of cancer and think cancer means uh, it's a, not only a disease, but a social um, taboo, uh, and they can't talk about it, admit they have it, they don't want to be diagnosed, so they'll let cancers grow and, and eventually they'll die from them. So there are cultural issues as well, and all I can suggest is it requires an effort. It requires people like us who know more to create information but then there's another level of people who have to translate that information into different languages and to pr present it to people at a level that they can understand and maybe will break down some of the barriers, cultural barriers, to um, acting on that information. I don't know. That's not a <laughs> that doesn't solve a problem, but maybe somebody else in the audience has better ideas. I don't, you know, this is my first time in, in Mexico, so I, I mean, I, I think I understand your issue because we have a similar issue in Canada. Not, maybe not as big, but similar problem. I would like to know if you have some research in, in, a, in men, I mean, breast problems, uh, cancer in, in men. In men? Yes. Um, I haven't done, in, in um, most of my experience, uh, breast cancer in men, of course, is a disease. It occurs. Uh, it's about 1% as common, in, um, certainly in Canada and the United States. About 1% of breast cancer occurs in men. Because it's a rare disease, it's difficult uh, because you can't, it's, it would be very difficult to make an argument for screening in men. Uh, just that uncommon. So usually it, that's a matter of self uh, awareness. If there's some change that uh, a man experiences, uh, to go as quickly as possible and have, have it investigated. And it can be investigated. Men can have mammograms and men can have breast ultrasound. So men have, do have breasts and it's possible to examine them. But the idea of screening, because it's such an un, you know, unusual disease in men, it w you couldn't really justify screening. Uh, my picture in the future, and uh, Dr. Randa may shoot me for this, is that screening eventually, I think, will not be imaging. It may be something more simple, like a test of saliva or blood or um, urine. And if it's positive, then you go and have imaging. So if it's a simple test, uh, then perhaps it's a test men could have as well. If it's a urine test, everyone could provide a sample. And if it's easy to analyze it and inexpensive, there's the first test. And then if it's positive, then you can justify more resources to, uh, on those people who are positive on test number one. You talked about assessing the uh, kinetics of uh, the uh, uptake of the contrast agent uh, in mammography. Many of the studies that, that focus on those kinetics uh, come from using cross-sectional images, like those from magnetic resonance imaging. So in mammography, which is a projective imaging technique, how does the accuracy of assessing those kinetic behaviors of the optic of the contrast agents uh, are affected by the projective nature of the imaging modality? Well, uh, you could probably answer the question as well as I can, but I think that um, uh, clearly the effect is a three-dimensional effect. If, if there's a washout of tissue, it's happening, and, and if you're doing projection imaging, there's going to be some superposition of information from different planes, and that could tend to um, dilute the, a signal, 
that you're seeing or mix signals with different kinetics together to confuse, make it a more confused measurement. So it would always be more beneficial to do this um, in a three-dimensional or looking at planar type images, um, realizing that the contrast medium could move from plane to plane or within the plane. Um, we haven't really done anything on that, um, but I think it is a, an important issue. You're definitely, definitely something. But the fact we can see kinetic effects, I think, at least is a good thing, even in two-dimensional imaging. Uh, there is another question by a colleague that has asked me to present it to you. Uh, intelligent, um, artificial intelligence. Uh, what's the prospect of artificial intelligence substituting the pathologist analysis? I love these questions. <laughs> okay, well, I, be, when you do multidisciplinary work, I think you have to be prepared to take on questions that go outside of your own discipline, so fine. Um, I think that um, certainly it depends again on the individual um, system a health system and what the responsibilities uh, is of the pathologist or the same problem with the radiologist in assessing uh, images, uh, in vivo images. Uh, in uh, my country and in the United States, the radiologist or the pathologist would have the absolute final responsibility for the diagnosis. So anything that's used should be thought of as a tool that may help them, but at the end, they will be responsible for the answer that is given. So the same way as you have a microscope or you, have vol you know, if we use a voltmeter or a spectrometer uh, to do something, it's the human at the end who makes the final decision as to interpreting what, what the measurement is. So I think it's similar. It just, to me, it just means the tools are getting better. At some point, you know, some foolish person can say, well, we don't need the people at all we could just use those tools. Um, in some cases, that may be okay. In other cases, it could lead. If we don't have full understanding, uh, if something's left out, um, then you could have crazy results. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting, very clear, uh, fantastic. Uh, can you comment on something about some alternative proposals like the positron emission tomography or thermography to detect the breast cancer? Okay, well, they're two very, very different things, yeah. So, uh, first of all, positron emissions. Uh, positron emission, I think, certainly will have a role in breast cancer. Uh, currently, the main reason why it wouldn't be used widely is fairly high dose. Uh, to not just to the site of interest, like if breast, but it's a, it's a dose to the body, to the bladder and to other parts as the injected uh, isotope has to uh, clear. Um, it's also expensive, um, and, um, but I think it could be sensitive. I'm sure it will find some cancers that, um, matter of fact, I think I have a slide in here that suggests it will certainly find some cancers that mammography or ultrasound or even MRI will not find. So if the goal is to find every cancer, I would think for sure it would add something. But for, as a practical tool, I think it right now would be more for problem solving. If there's something where you really know that you're not getting the information you need from the conventional modalities, it certainly would help. Also, further along in treatment, looking at response to therapy, I think uh, by using the right molecules, uh, you could get a lot of useful information. Unfortunately, most of the PET has been FDG only, which tells you fluorodeoxyglucose, so it tells you where the sugar, uh, what's happening with sugar in the body, uh, in, the, in the biology. Um, but there are other labeled agents that could be used that may be more interesting. There's a labeled uh, thymidine, it's called FLT. There's a labeled estrogen, FES, and uh, all, always using um, uh, fluorine, uh, radioactive fluorine as the uh, element for the positron part. Uh, but that may provide Im additional information. Thermography is another story. Thermography is a very pretty idea. Um, it's been many people, many companies have 
produced equipment and they've tried to sell this equipment and use it for patients, saying that it's harmless. Well, it's, it's harmless maybe from a physical point of view, but there's been no good studies so far that show that it has the accuracy to find breast cancer, small breast cancer, early enough and find it with a specificity so that it's not identifying every other thing that could cause a change in heat. So thermography is infrared imaging of the breast. In order to do it, most of it, you have to wait in, until the heat has come to the surface. There are more sophisticated techniques, and I think in principle, down in the future, if they were developed properly and tested properly, I, you know, there may be something there. But the biggest problem now is they have not been tested. And no people, when they introduce them, try to sell them right away without doing the kind of evaluation that's requ required to understand them and, and make sure that they actually work. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Any other question? If not, we thank you again. My, my pleasure. An excellent talk. And thank you for your visit. My pleasure. Thank you.